Oh, Jesus, my shirt is wrinkled. I'm going to get slaughtered for that. Should I change it? Nah. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Listen, I know this might be difficult for some of you to believe, but I'm not perfect. I can only recite the first 3,422 digits in pi, I don't like avocados, and my x-ray vision is honestly substandard. And a few weeks ago, I did a video on the best ships for evacuating humanity from Earth. And I like the list I put together, but as a few of you pointed out, I missed a couple big ones, including the Titan spacecraft from Titan AE. A ship specifically designed for housing humanity in space and for recreating a home planet for humans to live on. But alas, this is YouTube, and I can just make another video. And because we might be looking at a human evacuation in the very near future, whether due to a virus, an alien invasion, an asteroid, a nuclear explosion, or a dolphin ascendancy, it's important to consider possible pathways for getting humans off this planet and maintaining life in space. And Titan AE provides a blueprint for doing so, as the humans in that scenario had to leave Earth due to the pure hatred and jealousy of alien scum. And so in this video, I'm going to go through the ships that the humans used in Titan AE and list their features. And for the hell of it, I'm going to throw in the alien ships too, because know thy enemy. Titan AE takes place about 1,000 years into the future, and so humans in that time had a whole bunch of advanced technology at their disposal. In the year 3028, atmospheric ships had taken the place of cars and were ubiquitous. Additionally, ships that could easily take humans from the atmosphere into space were mass-produced, likely due to Blue Zeno showing up to wipe humans out. And humans used these ships to transport themselves off the planet. Fifteen years later, humans were fully adapted to living in space in a technological sense and had developed all sorts of small personal vessels for flying around space stations and such. But on to the good stuff. Humans had all sorts of ships at this point in time. The first one we are going to look at is the Valkyrie, a spaceship commanded by Captain Joseph Corso. This ship really represents the state of technology that humans had reached in this time. On one hand, it was a top-of-the-line vessel. On another, it was, to use a nautical term, broke ass. It reminds me a lot of the Millennium Falcon or Lando Carl Rissian. You love it, but it might fuck you without consent. The best part about the Valkyrie is its advanced FTL technology, though I do suppose it's a bit redundant to say advanced FTL technology, as in 2020, present day, all FTL technology is advanced to us. As for the Valkyrie, well, there's really no delay between initiating the ship's FTL tech and reaching light speed. Such helps out a lot when using FTL travel to escape enemies. The ship has very simple manual piloting controls akin to what you might see in a modern day airplane. I'm not completely sure if the ship has an autopilot function, but given its FTL capabilities, it probably does. In any case, the ship when piloted by humans seems to be able to move very well, and even at times is able to keep up with smaller, more agile ships. The ship can fly in atmospheres, and so it can swoop down and land on planetary surfaces for missions, and then take off into space directly for quick getaways. The ship's repulsor technology helps for said landings and takeoffs. The ship also has a med bay with technology capable of healing serious wounds, including from alien pulse blasts of some sort, and being that Akima Kunimoto, the ship's pilot, and who as far as I can tell has no medical education, is the one who patches Kale up after his escape from the dredge, I'm guessing that the medical tech on the ship is rather straightforward and easy to use. The Valkyrie also has holographic mapping technology for plotting courses and searching locations in the universe. There's also radar technology that is able to track enemies in the vicinity of the ship. Though I'm not sure just how well this technology works, as the ship had trouble tracking a simple rocket ship in close proximity. The ship also has a bunch of different technology for communicating with other life forms across space, including a video conference platform that seems to be capable of FTL communication. As far as weapon systems go, the ship has point defense weapons that can be manually controlled from inside the ship, and works with the ship's tracking tech to lock onto enemies. The ship's guns fire some sort of laser beams capable of destroying other ships in a single blow. The full power of these weapons is unknown. The ship also has room for storing many different portable weapons on it for both hunting and combat purposes. Actually, the ship has a whole lot of storage space available. It has a cargo bag capable of docking smaller ships inside of it, and also stores a vehicle capable of both flight and traveling on water like a boat. The Valkyrie is well prepared for planetary exploration, and in the case of Captain Corso specifically, for search missions. The ship also features what seem to be heavy hydraulic doors throughout, which is very good for keeping invading species out or preventing prisoners from escaping. There's also amenities on the ship for the crew's enjoyment, such as a variety of beverages and a lookout room for enjoying the views of space. The lookout room features swivel chairs that seem to conform to the movement of its users. Truly the best that the 31st century has to offer. Oh, and of course, I forgot to mention my favorite amenity on the ship. Advanced shower curtain technology that helps crew members avoid Me Too moments. 
Funny enough, as advanced as the ship is, it seems like it's put together with rather mundane materials, and that 21st century tools can be used to fix it. Okay, as for the other human ships of note, we have the Phoenix, which is basically an antiquated rocket ship by the year 3043, which I believe is when we see it. When it comes to taking off and flying through space, the ship seems to operate not unlike modern rocket ships. Kale does mention that the ship has an ionic vacuum drive, which, while not overly specific, is probably what the ship uses for thrust. However, it also employs repulsor tech to hover and maneuver around smaller areas. The ship can be piloted with a simple joystick akin to what you might see in modern day helicopters, and it features some basic radar tech as well. Then we have the eponymous Titan itself. I was actually kind of disappointed that we never got to see more of it, so we don't know the full extent of what it can do. However, we know the major plot points. The Titan is capable of both atmospheric and spaceflight, it has radar technology of all sorts, and has point defense weapons that, like the Valkyrie, can be manually controlled from inside the ship. This next thing might not seem that essential, but the ship also had really bright lights, if that's of any interest to you. Using deductive reasoning and operating Thetan level 8 analytical thinking, I have concluded that Kale's father, Sam, who built the Titan, included the bright lights so that people can see what they're doing. Stored within the ship are DNA samples from thousands or hundreds of thousands of terrestrial species. I assume these samples are for use in cloning later, when a new human home planet has been created. And as I've obviously been getting at, yes, the Titan's most important feature is its planet-forming technology, which can be used to make a new Earth. And thanks to the ship's FTL capabilities, humans can set up their new planet anywhere in the galaxy they so desire. This system requires a lot of energy to operate, without which it won't work. But if needed, it can be rerouted to harness alien energy in order to start up. Kale Tucker, underrated Xenoslayer, I'm telling ya. Guy fed on aliens to build a new Earth for humans. What a boss. Oh, and lest I forget, the Titan also features a super cool multi-directional elevator system for quickly getting around the inside of the ship, and has super cool flight-capable spacesuits on hand as well. Okay, finally we have to cover the alien ships, the Dredge Fleet. Titan AE features small Dredge fighter ships and a large mothership. The fighter's most prominent feature is that they are very agile and quick, and are hard to lose when they are in pursuit, especially because they can go underwater. They fire some sort of energy beams that honestly don't seem to do much damage, but each fighter also has a tractor beam capable of beaming in beings and objects. Such beams are so finely tuned that they can pull a weapon out of a user's hands. The ships can also be piloted by just about anyone with two arms with ease. There are no tricky controls. You just might accidentally get electrocuted. There are electrical energy currents that run throughout these ships, or perhaps the better way of saying it is that electrical energy makes up these ships, as the dredge and their technology are all pure energy. We can't even really call their ships ships. They look like ships, but are really just energy shaped like ships. This is why the fact that they're easily destroyed isn't such a big deal. I assume that as long as the dredge mothership has energy, that they can just create more dredge and more ships. Actually, this is why I kind of consider the dredge to be a hive race and why we can't really differentiate between the fighters and the mothership as their entire race and fleet seem to emanate from a single energy source. When fighters return to the mothership, they don't dock, they just kind of sink through the floor and perhaps even meld back with the mothership. As all of the dredge and their technology are one, within the mothership they exert full control over their surroundings, and can use electrical currents and beams to attack, paralyze, and imprison their foes. Yes, dredge electrical security fields are impenetrable. Unless you penetrate them using a simple two-finger technique, a move that can defeat pretty much any of their technology. Not sure how they F that one up, but hey, Xenos suck. Though I should give the dredge credit for the powerful energy beam that the mothership is able to shoot out, and looked like it could do some damage before the humans basically used the titan to drink the dredge and use them as building blocks for a beautiful new earth. Anyway, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of what is now an animated sci-fi classic. If you're wondering where the damn Expanse content is, it's coming. I just want to take my time to do a good job. I'm working on some videos on the proto molecule, so stay tuned to that and hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss these videos when they do come out. Also like this video um, if you enjoyed it. And um, for now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.